Would you stand with us? In Psalm 34, it says, let us exalt the Lord's name together. Let us sing and worship him. So that's what we're going to do. Would you sing, Be Thou My Vision with us? Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, say that Thou art, Thou my best thought, by day or by night, waking or sleeping, Thy prayer. Wisdom. Oh 
love you. We worship and adore you. We thank you for singing. We thank you for the cross. Lord, I pray that you would be our vision, that you would be what we see and who we worship. And we pray all these things in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 24. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 24. We're uh, still at the front part of this uh, series on the great love of God. And um, as, you, uh, as you turn in the text and we get ready to go to it, I want to give you the definition of God's love that I'm going to use throughout the course of the rest of our time here. Uh, I, when I think about God's love, I'm thinking about a very specific thing. And uh, when I say, uh, when I talk about God's love and you hear me say uh, stuff about God's love, I want us to understand what we mean. And so uh, here's my definition of God's love. It is his commitment, God's commitment, based on who he is to delight in you, to give you wonderful things, and to protect you from harm. It's God's commitment based on who he is to delight in you, to give you wonderful things, and to protect you from harm. That's what I mean when I talk about God's love. Now, I'm going to break it up here for a moment or two into two big chunks. It starts out with God's commitment as God. God's love is his commitment based on who he is. This is why it is so important uh, that in our last time together talking about this, uh, we spent some time talking about the fact from 1 John 4 that God is love. Uh, because God is love, he makes a commitment to demonstrate love, to show love. It is, it is who he is. Because God is God, he must demonstrate himself to be God. And when God is love, he must demonstrate himself to be loving. And so we can be certain that when we know God, we will see his love. So that's the first part of the definition is that, is that God's love is based on his character. He can be nothing other than loving and he must be loving. But the second part of the definition is his demonstration of that love. So he, he must show it. He is love. He must show it. So when he shows it, what does that look like? Well, and what I'm saying in my definition is that it looks like three things. It looks like him delighting in you. It looks like, second, giving you wonderful things. And it looks like, third, protecting you from harm. So because he's God, sorry, because he's God, uh, he's going to love you and that's going to be an experience of delight in his heart. That's going to be wonderful gifts to you. And it's going to be protection against bad things for you. That's the, the definition. And tonight, we're going to start looking at those first of those three demonstrations. We're going to start looking at God's experience of delight in us. And a great place to see it is Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 24. And this is what God says. He, Jesus, said, a man 
had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them, and not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country, and there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I'm dying here with hunger. I will say to him, I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf, kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. Let's pray. Father, I want to pray that you would take the truth from this passage and the other passages that we're going to look at tonight, and that you would show us what you think about us. I pray that you would reveal to each heart your great love. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is easily the most famous of Jesus' parables, and there's probably one main reason why that is true. It's because the message of this parable is a message that resonates with every single person who needs Christ. I, uh, I just read it. You can remember the parable by remembering three different categories. There is first the son's request. There is second, the son's rebellion. And there is third, the son's return. So the son's request, hey, dad, rich dad, I would like all of my inheritance so I can blow this popsicle stand. You know what he's saying? Dad, I I want your money, and I don't want you. This is a request of the son wishing his father were dead. He wants to live his life enjoying his father's gifts, but not near his father. It's a shocking request. More shocking than the request is that the father granted it. Okay. Dad gets out the checkbook and gives him his share of his inheritance and sends him off. That's the request. Then comes the rebellion. Uh, A boy this corrupt isn't uh, planning on investing the funds wisely and living responsibly. He he engages in, in what the text called loose living. Some translations call it wild living or reckless living. He engaged in carousing. There was women and parties and drugs and booze. He lived it up. In fact, he he lived it up to such an extent that the great gift of his lavishly wealthy father was evaporated in no time. And what happened then is uh, sin did what sin does, and it never keeps its promise. It always says, this is going to be so great. This is going to be so fun. You can do whatever you want. 
until you can't. And so the formerly rich boy now finds himself isolated and alone and starving, and he is pushed into a pigsty to feed pigs. And though he had been able to feast at his father's house, now he is looking at the slop that the pigs are eating. In Jewish culture, this is This is the lowest of the low. Pigs are unclean animals. They are not kosher to eat. And so Jesus is portraying to his Jewish audience that this guy has gone worse than low. He has gone lower than the bottom. It is as bad as it could be. That's the rebellion. And then comes the return. The... uh, The phrase in Luke chapter 15 is one of my favorite phrases in the Bible. It says he came to his senses. Have you ever seen this? Have you ever experienced this? When, uh, if you're a Christian, you have. When you're so enamored with sin, it's like it hypnotizes you. It's like all you can see is that forbidden woman or that forbidden fruit or that thing you're not supposed to do. And, and then there is this divine intervention, this moment of grace when the scales fall off your eyes and you, you awaken, you come to yourself. Have you ever seen someone do this? Do you remember when this happened to you? And you realized what a fool you've been. You realized what a waste <laughs> This whole thing, this happened to the prodigal son. He came to himself. His eyes opened. He came to his senses. And he realized, what in the world? Everybody at my dad's house is living like a king. And I'm here in the mud. I got to get out of here. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to dad. And I'm going to say, just make me the lowest of the low. That's what I'll do. I'll admit that I've sinned. I'll admit that I've been wrong. And I will grovel. And I will just throw myself on the mercy of the court. And hopefully, hopefully I'll be allowed back in the servant quarters. So he, um, he returns home. He's rehearsing his grovel. But there is something that he does not count on. And this is what makes the story so great. This is why everybody loves it. The story portrays not just a sinful boy that is returning home. It portrays a righteous father that's waiting. The the story only works if dad is looking out towards the horizon and he he sees the familiar gate of his son's walk. And this Jewish man of nobility does what Jewish men of nobility don't do. He hikes up his tunic and he cuts into a run to go to his boy who is covered in pig slop, whose breath reeked of liquor. And he wrapped him in his embrace and he celebrated his return. What the boy didn't count on is Luke chapter 15, verse 20. He got up and he came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. Do you see the, do you see the father looking, looking into the setting sun to see if he can see his boy coming? Is he coming back yet? I wonder if today will be the day. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. That word compassion. It only shows up in the New Testament on the lips of Jesus. When Jesus uses this word a handful of times, he is 
only ever and always describing his emotion that he is experiencing for people or the emotion that God experiences for his people. The word compassion in the ancient world was a gut level response. It, it, it referred to a feeling in the gut, to a twisting in the gut. When, when, we, when we talk about our compassion today, we talk about our heart. When they talked about compassion in the ancient world, they were talking about their guts. What, what this says is that the father looked out and saw the son and he had his stomach flip over. His stomach flipped that his son was there. He felt a gut level expression of compassion. That is what the rebellious boy didn't count on. It talks about God's experience of delight in his people, even the sinful ones, because there's no other people that he's got other than the sinful ones. He talks about an experience of delight of God in his people. What comes into God's mind when he thinks about loving you? What is that? When we as people say we love somebody, we usually mean, you might use different language if you were up here instead of me, but I think most people, when, when, when you say to me that I love you, or when I say to you that I love you, or when you look at your spouse and you say I love you, uh, the love might feel a little bit different if it's a wife or a husband versus kids or a friend, but, but mostly we're talking about a swelling sense of emotion. Whatever you want to call it, ever how you want to say it, we're talking about an emotional experience of joy that is tied to what we think of that person. And I want you to know that if my definition of God's love is right, that God's love is his commitment based on who he is to delight in you, that God, when he thinks of you, has that swelling sense of emotion. God's love for you is going to be more than that. We talked about that last time. We got several more weeks to talk about this, but it's never going to be less than that. Our shorthand for it will be that God delights in you. Now, here's the thing. If you're going to know what somebody thinks about you, you, you have to listen to them speak. You can't look at me and know what I think about you. I can't look at you and know what you think about me. If we're going to know what is in someone's heart for us, we have to listen to them tell us. And the great news about the Bible is, is the Bible reveals God's heart for his people. And I want you to listen to a few verses that sort of expound what I'm calling this, this internal sense of delight that God has. God has this internal sense of delight. Listen to a few passages. So first, God calls his people his treasured possession. Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 18, it says, The Lord has today declared you to be his people, a treasured possession. The prophet Isaiah says that God's people are precious to him. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 4, it says, since you are precious in my sight, since you are honored and I love you, God says this about his people. In Zephaniah, you got to work hard to get to Zephaniah, it's between Habakkuk and Haggai, but uh, Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17, the Lord your God is in your midst a victorious warrior, warrior and he will exult over you with joy. 
This is fascinating language from God on behalf of his people. God is a warrior, strong and big, and he exalts over you with joy. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3. The Lord appeared to him saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I've drawn you with loving kindness. God looks at his sinful people and he's like, I've I've loved you since forever. And I've drawn you close to me with my love and because of my love. One of the most amazing passages in all the Bible is Hosea chapter 11. You know the story of Hosea. Uh, God is portraying to his people how much he loves them and what his love for them is like. And to illustrate it, he raises up a prophet to marry a woman who is a harlot. She sleeps around. She has innumerable acts of fornication. And he keeps taking her back and taking her back. And the whole point is, God is like, that's what you do to me. I, I, I am a faithful husband to you, and you keep turning your back on me. And God talks about judgment that's coming because you won't be faithful to me spiritually as your spiritual husband. And he talks about these judgments. But then in Hosea chapter 11, verse 8, listen to this. He 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 uses words like Ephraim and Israel and Adma and Zeboim to talk about his people. That's just language for God's people. But listen to what he says. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I surrender you, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart is turned over within me. All my compassions are kindled. Emotionally, the Lord here is ablaze. He is consumed with affection for his people. I can't treat you like these losers who aren't my people. You sin and you deny and you run around with other idols. I can't give you up. How could I ever do it? I love you. God says through the prophet, God's love will never end. In Lamentations chapter 3 verse 22, it says the Lord's loving kindnesses Indeed, never cease, for his compassions never fail. God's love never ends. God's love for you never ends. And it's not about you. This is why it's so important that we start with who God is, that God is love. God's love for you never ends, not because you're infinitely lovable, but because God is infinitely loving. God just keeps loving and loving and loving. It's not possible for his love to stop. As one of his children, God freely sets his affection on you so that you are his precious possession. God honors and treasures you. God is for you. God has compassion on you. God rejoices over you. He delights in you. He's filled with longing for you. He pursues a closeness of relationship with you that will never end even when you sin. That is... God's internal experience of love for you, and my shorthand for it is that God delights in you. That's what it means. Now, there are two kinds of people in here right now. One kind of person would say, I believe it. Whew, I believe that. You don't know why you believe it. You just like the sound of it. And you're super excited that I said it. I don't care, even care what else he says. I just believe that. And there are some of you that are nervous. Mm-hmm. That sounds a little emotional. That sounds a little unlike God. It sounds like maybe he's, he's not honoring the great glory of God and Maybe he's not honoring the, like, vile nature of our sin. And, and I don't know, I, 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 read a, I read a Bible without errors in it, and I worship a really big God, and, and this sounds all a little, a little touchy-feely. I'm uncomfortable. Well, um, whoever you are, whichever one of those you are, I want to ask you to move a little bit. If, uh, if you just... 
Love that I said it without objection. I want to ask you to come with me for a few minutes and let me anchor this even more in Scripture than I already have so that you'll know it's true and it'll be rock solid. And it won't just be true because you're a touchy-feely person and you want a touchy-feely God. And if you're nervous, you're not allowed, and you, you'll go with me here, you're not allowed to fail to believe what God has revealed about himself. And so come with me and let's anchor this even more in the Word of God than I already have. Regardless of who you are, regardless of how you respond to what I've just been saying, the reality is this is not too good to be true. This is who God is. This is how he feels about you. God does have emotions. Some people get nervous when we talk about this because your experience of emotions is the human experience of emotions. It's a sinful experience of emotions. But God has emotions all over the place. We could, we could do a whole series on the emotions that God experiences inside himself. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 6, it's very clear that God is sad. He is sorry, the Bible says, that he made the world. In Psalm chapter 7, verse 11, God gets angry. It says the Lord is angry all day. He's filled with indignation all day. In Psalm 104, verse 31, it says the Lord's happy. The Lord is glad. It says the Lord is glad in his work. One of the emotions that God has is love. God experiences the emotion of love. In Micah chapter 7, verse 18, the prophet says this, Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession. He does not retain his anger forever. Why? Because he delights in unchanging love. Two things there. One, love. God delights in the emotion of love. God delights in the emotion of love because it is an emotion that springs, na springs naturally from who he is as God. He is love, and so he delights in that love. The other thing about that love is that it is unchanging. This is what protects God's love from the shifty changiness of human love. We get suspicious if we are suspicious when we hear about love because all we know is our experience of love, whether it's coming out of our heart or out of those that we've known, and we have seen people who are driven and tossed by their emotions. They feel giddy and they get crazy about some loser boy or some lunatic girl. They fail to love what they should love. You're married to a great woman and you're acting like a jerk and a sinner. You're not loving what you're supposed to love. Or your, your love is here today and gone tomorrow. You're moody and today you're in a really good mood about this person that you love. And the next day you're in a really bad mood about it. And so the love is shifty and changing. But you don't have to be nervous about God's love because God's love is perfect. God's love is constant. It is unchanging. The, uh, the theological language for this, the, the $25 theological language for this is it's divine impassibility. It means that God doesn't change. If he loves, he loves. And God doesn't change because of external circumstances in who he is. God changes because of who he is in relation to what he has made. But he's not shifty and changey. He's perfect and, and constant. And so we can embrace that God has emotions because God's emotions are perfect and they don't shift like ours do. Another thing I want you to see is, is we, as we root into this biblical teaching that God delights in you is that God's glory fits with God's love. One of the things that is absolutely, positively crystal clear in the Bible is that God is chiefly motivated by his own glory. God does what he does for the fame of his name. God does what he does to prove that he is great and amazing. God does what he does to drop, drop the jaws of the people who know him so that they will exult. 
in him. In Isaiah chapter 48, verse 11, God says, for my own sake, for my own sake, I will act. For how can my name be profaned? And my glory I will not give to another. This is for my sake. This is for my sake. That's why I'm acting. My name can't be profaned. I don't give away my glory to anybody else. This passage is not in the Bible so that you'll think that maybe God has a different sort of motivation than his own glory. And there's dozens, hundreds of passages just like this. You, uh, you get to the New Testament, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, and with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. The Apostle Paul endured difficulty. He endured this ongoing thorn in the flesh, whatever this medical problem was that wouldn't go away, he endured it for Christ's sake, so that Christ as God would get glory. It's the same Old Testament, it's the same in the New Testament. God's glory is his chief motivator. But do you know that God also does things for your sake? This is something that is just as clear in the Bible. In Exodus chapter 18, in verse 8, listen to this. Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake. All the hardship that had befallen them on the journey and how the Lord had delivered them. You see this time and time again in the Old Testament. You see it in the New Testament in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. It says, the love of Christ controls us having concluded this, that one died for all, and therefore all died, and he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. There is, there's, we're supposed to live for Christ's sake. But look at verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. Some, some of your translations actually say, for our sake. In the same passage, there is for Christ's sake, and there is for our sake. The point is that God acts for his sake and for our sake when you put the Bible together. And this makes all the sense in the world. If I say, um, I want to serve as pastor of this church, to shepherd these people. That can be true. But it's not also wrong if I like being here. I, I can want to serve you and I can enjoy it and these two things aren't bad. I can want to take Lauren on a date to give her a break, say, babe, this date is for you. And if I'm away from the kids for a little bit and I like that, that's not bad either. So the presence of, of two motivations doesn't neutralize one or the other. In fact, here's, here's the amazing grace and glory of God. That God is love means that he knows the way to do everything for his glory while loving you. In fact, every example that I'm aware of, there's... Uh, there's a couple hundred in the Bible. Every example that I'm aware of where God acts for his glory, he's always doing something wonderful for his people. I, I don't, I'm not aware of the example in the Bible where it says God does something for his glory and his people get the short end of the stick. In other words, God's glory is never at odds with his love for you. Here's just... One example, in Psalm chapter, Psalm 25, verse 7. Psalm 25, verse 7. From you comes my praise. Oops, I'm reading the wrong psalm. Where'd it go? Psalm 25, verse 7. Where'd you go? Yes, there it is. Okay, Psalm 25, verse 7. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. 
According to your loving kindness, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. This is wonderful. You see this time and again. God is acting for the sake of his goodness. He is behaving out of his love. And what happens? You get something. And I get something. Our sins get forgiven. Our sins get forgiven and God is glorified. He acts for his sake and he acts for your sake. When Jesus Christ lives a perfect life and he dies on the cross and he rises from the grave, it is for the glory of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is heralded as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and for world without end, amen, he will be hailed as the conquering king who defeated sin. But we don't get the short end of the stick on that deal. Because who did he defeat sin for? He defeated it for you and for me. And so God is glorified and we are loved. The life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus is for his sake and it is for ours too. And these things aren't at odds. The fact that God is love means that when he pursues his own glory, he's able to do that simultaneously with pursuing love for us. The big thing. The big thing that makes it so hard to believe that God could have this kind of delight, this kind of language that I read to you from the Bible, is that we are sinners. You, you know people who are difficult to love. You know people who are a pain in the neck. And you think that because someone who is difficult, challenging, mean, maybe truly awful, because it's hard, if not impossible, for you to love somebody like that, then it must be hard for God to love people like that. But that's not true. God is love. It's true, we're all sinners. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But you've got to remember Luke chapter 15, verse 20. The father sees the boy who the last time he saw him said, I wish you were dead. And he took his money and he ran. And in between that moment and the current moment, he had spent all the money. And he had sinned in ways that we probably can't imagine. But when the father saw his sinful boy coming over the horizon, he felt compassion. His stomach flipped over. It's the father's compassion. The prodigal son is a parable. Jesus made it up. Jesus made up the story to illustrate a point to you. And you know what the point is. It's the reason the parable is so famous. The father in the story is God. And the boy in the story is you. And it's me. And we do what this boy does. We take our father's gifts and we tell God we don't want you, we deny your existence, and we run away and we do whatever we want. But when grace enters into our hearts and the scales fall from our eyes and we come to our senses and we come home, the love of the Father drives him to embrace us. And he doesn't care what we smell like. He doesn't care what sin we're dragging behind us. He doesn't care what we have done. He just forgives us. He delights in us. How could he do that? How could God, who is perfect and holy and righteous, who is separated from sinners, 
How could his stomach flip over with delight, his spiritual stomach? (laughs) How could he do that? In John chapter 17, verse 23, Jesus is talking to the Father about his people. But the people purchased for him, but the blood of Jesus Christ. And listen to what Jesus says about you if you're trusting in Christ. He says, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. I can't say it. This is... Oh my gosh, my contact came out and everything. This is the love that God has for you. When he sends his grace into your heart and changes you and draws you to himself, he sees his perfect son, Jesus Christ. And he takes great delight in you. And he will forever. Let's stand and let's pray. God in heaven, we are overwhelmed that you would conceive of such a way to look at sinful people and see Jesus. I have to confess, if someone other than Jesus Christ had said those words, I could not believe it myself. But we trust Jesus Christ, your son. And he has said to you that you love us as you love him. And he has said to you that he desires the world to know that it's true. And so, Father, there is nothing for sinful people to do but bask in your great love for us. It's more than we could imagine. It's more than we could hope. But we believe your word and we say it's true. And we're thankful in Jesus' name. Amen.